If you'd gone to London about 150 years ago, the one place you would not have gone to was Saffron Hill. The name may sound charming, even fragrant, but this was a toxic place, filthy and dangerous. It had mud and a stench that never went away, no matter how dry the season. Piles of restless people lay passed out on the ground. Anybody awake would have been as happy to rob you as to do anything. All that is, except for one. Because Saffron Hill was the stomping ground of Charles Dickens, who walked the streets of London at night alone, with only, he said, the church clocks for company. A waking dream, or nightmare. Dickens' night walks are the perfect image of how artists think. Because he was doing what all creative people do. He was wandering, alone, and noticing. A mind like a street sweeper, just picking up details. About the same time, you'd have found Ibsen doing exactly the same thing on the streets of Dresden, or Rome, or Amalfi. Just looking, listening to conversations, hearing what history never records. And although they found dramatically different things, Ibsen and Proust worked in exactly the same way, picking through details, looking at what lay on top and what might lie underneath. They all had what the Irish poet Kavanagh says is sensitive humility and sensitive courage, humble because willing to look at really trivial things and courageous because they dared to look beyond the ordinary to pose questions most of us never ask. These wandering minds are walking without a map and without a plan, just making memories with absolutely no promise of reward. What happens next? Well, ideas start to emerge. The great filmmaker, Frederick Wiseman, said that at this stage, what's important is to pay attention to the periphery of your mind, not to adopt some formal, logical, approach. Some ideas fall away, and some get stuck. In his youth, the director, Peter Brook, said he remembered seeing a man one day just sitting in front of a prison. The man offered him food, and he said no. And afterwards, Brook regretted it. But he said, he didn't know who the man was, or what he was doing, or what was really going on, but the image remained in his mind, latent. Eventually, ideas fuse. Some kind of theme starts to emerge. All the writers, uh, poets, artists, musicians I've ever worked with say they don't know how this happens, or when it happens or why, it's just that at some point, some idea takes precedence over the rest, and the word work has to start. This is a dangerous moment. The artist Tracy Emin says she's sometimes so afraid to start a painting that she has to sketch for a while to work up the nerve. Because every day, artists put their lives on the line committing work and time and effort with absolutely no guarantee of the outcome. Why this thing? Why that? Is this the right idea? Will it lead anywhere? But somehow there comes a moment where the work must be done. Why, after 50 years, did Peter Brook decide right then was the moment to write his play, The Prisoner? Even he can't say. The filmmaker Mike Lee once said to me, well, you know, nothing happening is something happening. 
Some weird mixture of invention and discovery propels the work, and it changes the people who make it. The writer who starts a book is not the same person who finishes it. This is a risk, too. There are no signposts. The path is precarious, uncertain. There are no guarantees. The artist Katie Patterson once said to me, she'd been afraid to become an artist, knowing how hard the work and the life would be. Artists are among the toughest people I have ever worked with. What they add to their lives and to ours is attention to anomalies, to the underrated and the overlooked. And in those things, they find meaning. And doing that, they become the epitome of the human, unpredictable and unique. But this process, if you could even call it a process, right, flies in the face of the way that we live today. It's so random, collecting all this detail with no idea how much of it's going to be useful and how much of it's never going to amount to anything. Right? It's unpredictable. Will this be a success or a failure? And even if it is, in five years, ten years, a hundred years, it was two hundred years before anybody thought King, Le King Lear was a half-decent play. It looks like play. It feels like work. It's all so inefficient. So what do we do? We go online and we do the research and we find the major sites and we make the reservations and we buy the tickets and we find the perfect walk and we map the perfect walk on our phones and we schedule it and then we take the perfect walk and we get organized. The problem is, how can we know what experience we want before we've had it. In working this way, we become predictable and determined to ourselves and to technology. Efficient, just like everybody else, not making a path, just following one which has all kinds of reper repercussions. The first is that all of those skills we have that we outsource to technology degrade. So the more we use GPS, the less spatial awareness we have. The more photographs we take, the fewer memories we have. Online research is faster, but it doesn't last as long. And the more we try to multitask, the more we lose our capacity to hold attention. All the gestational skills of artists fall from our hands. And it's not just some of us. It's all of us doing the same thing walking the same paths to the same sites. Because technology optimizes for efficiency and scale, better, faster, cheaper. And so the more people, the more data, the more data, the easier it becomes to prescribe the path, to condition and train us to like what we're offered and what we're recommended. Unmediated human behavior is not predictable. That's why algorithms can't predict your child's career, and they can't predict criminal behavior, and they can't predict what movies are going to be profitable, even though that's what they promise, because that's the intent. Social efficiency by design. Of course, it's much more profitable for business if we just do what we are urged, nudged to do. If we could just like the movies that were recommended, buy the films that were recommended, life would be, for business, so much more efficient. The price we pay isn't just that we all get a great deal more boring, right? The price we pay is the priceless loss of diversity. 
which is not about political correctness, and it isn't an optional extra. In economic fields and in finance, we know that monopolies are dangerous because a concentration of power invites abuse. So we preserve diversity because it makes us safer. In the natural world, we know that biodiversity confers resilience. But the ash trees all over Europe are dying because, for the most part, we planted one variety, which it turns out is susceptible to one fungus that's killing all the trees. Diversity, variety would have given us more resilience. And so, any homogeneity of thinking, of being, threatens to reduce all of the incredible array of human talents and capabilities that we know we need to answer the questions in front of us and to confront the challenges that, pose, that are posed in front of us. We need as many of these human skills as we can possibly find. And the more that we rely on the same ways of thinking and the same modes of behavior, using the same tools, visiting the same sites, the more that diversity is at risk. We may not all be artists, but we need the diversity, the toughness that they show us. In walking streets these days, I can't help but notice, everybody plugged into their music and watching their phones, and it makes me think of dancing bears. In Bulgaria, for centuries, there was a tradition of taming and training bears to dance, but when Bulgaria joined the European community, it was outlawed because it's cruel. So a fantastic, huge park was built with a natural habitat and lakes and a natural diet, and all the bears went to live there. But people started to notice that even in this fantastic environment, the bears still dance. They have freedom now, but they can't remember how to use it. Are we all becoming dancing bears, still too tame and afraid to walk our own path, to make our own roots? and too ready to surrender to the really meager rewards of convenience, predictability, efficiency. It's become a little fashionable lately to say, well, I get all this diversity stuff, I can see it has its place, but you know, human beings aren't really like that. They don't really like diversity. It's too hard, it's too difficult, it creates conflict, you know, it's just... You know, we have to be honest, human beings like people just like themselves, you know, we have to accept that. It's a fantastically dangerous and myth, misleading myth. You saw that when here in Germany, Jochen Wegner did this fantastic experiment with Die Zeit Online, where he brought 12,000 people together of diametrically opposite perspectives to meet and have a conversation. And the only people who didn't like doing that were the ones whose partners didn't turn up. Exactly the same experiment repeated in the UK. Exactly the same experience. Brexiteers, Remainers, 22, 72, meeting up, becoming fast friends, enjoying the difference that they had to offer each other. I do an experiment with executives where I ask them to have a conversation with one of their colleagues, not to do what they usually do, which is let's find out what we all have in common, but to find out what they don't have in common. Now this is difficult, it takes quite a long time for many of them to get going because it's uncomfortable and not at all something they're accustomed to. And yet they end up loving the experience. They love the experience because they find out so much about their colleagues and realize that their difference is a gift to each other. And they love it because they feel seen for what and who they are 
which is unique. We have a lot of problems to solve, and what's at stake is enormous. And there is no single technology, no single mindset or data set, no matter how vast, that's going to be able to answer all of those challenges. We need, in facing an unpredictable future, unpredictable minds, comfortable with navigating ambiguity, uncertainty. This conference asks, what are you adding? What we add to ourselves and to each other is our difference in the places where we wander, in the paths that we make, in the meaning that we find in our lives and the lives of others. We are more than data. We are more than numbers. And we have freedom. If we remember to use it. Thank you.